Nanti uh, ada ke? Thank you for your time. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, this is an, our Heritage Press Day in which we would like to share with you what Suko South Africa is all about, or Southern Africa is all about, and how we perceive our future. So, once again, thank you for your time. Let us just please make some arrangements for the sessions. Um, <laughs> The people around the table here and, and, and in the hall, will you just please make sure that we've got some distance between us for this Chocha, this COVID thing. Uh, the guys at home, obviously, you're okay. The, 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 the COVID thing won't get to you there. The focus of the press day is to introduce Suko SA to the press and other interested parties and to claim our collective right to speak on the perpetuation of our hunting and wildlife traditions and heritage mm -hmm. under the banner of sustainable economic wildlife management systems to benefit all South Africans. Mm -hmm. Our right to speak flows from our hunting tradition and heritage and, is, and its sustainable spin-offs into our country's exceptional wildlife heritage of rewilding more than 18 million hectares of marginal farmlands into viable wildlife habitat on approximately 13,000 game farms. The vast majority of our country's game species are today found on privately owned game farms. These species include Oribe, Roan and Sable, which are only found in very small numbers in a few government-managed protected areas. The 50 years of government-driven conservation efforts between 1930 and 1960 resulted in raising game numbers in this country from very few of different species to approximately 1 million animals. And we have to acknowledge that effort because it was not only government's conservation departments and the different in, the, in those days in the provinces, but also a number of farmers who were prepared to take on the task of protecting specific species. However, on economically viable game farms, the game count has in the 60 years since 1960 risen to an estimate of more than 9 million game animals in private ownership. Privately owned game farms today make up approximately 16,8% of our country's surface area in comparison with the 6,1% of the country's surface area comprising of protected areas as defined by the Protected Areas Act. Few other countries in the world have seen this kind of growth in its game populations and in its associated conservation of rewilding of habitat for the numbers of game to thrive on, supported by a vibrant hunting sector. Note that this growth was not brought about by government efforts. It was definitely brought about by government enabling legislation, which allowed for private ownership of these game animals and its sustainable use through inter alia hunting. And this is something which has really started taking off somewhere in the late 1980s and has continued up to this day. This press day will consist of two 20 minute presentations and one 30 minute presentation. First will be on our heritage and tradition of hunting uh, by Stephen Palos, who is the vice chair of SUCO SA and also the CEO of CHASA, which is the Confederation of Hunting Associations of South Africa. Stephen, thank you very much. We're privileged to have you here uh, and to be able to share with your knowledge. Thank you very much. The second on rewilding of marginal farmlands and the creation of a wildlife heritage would have been done by Richard York, our treasurer and CEO of WRSA. Unfortunately, he had serious medical problems in his family. And we are very blessed that we have Gerard Heineke, who is the chairman of WRSA here today, to take us into that presentation. Thank you very much, Gerard, and thank you for coming to share your vast knowledge with us uh, in the field in which you are and for which you have a passion. And the third one will be by, my, by myself. On the right of these two sets of traditions and heritage who has given Suko as a collective to speak on economic sound sustainable use 
as the only viable option for wildlife management in this country. This as opposed to the direction of protectionism and preservation, the biocentric approach of the current proposed DFFE policies, that's the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, in which they seemingly want to steer the management of our country's wildlife into. If you read the high-level panel of experts report and the proposed policy concerning the use of lion, leopard, uh, rhino and elephant, you'll see that this biocentric and preservation approach is coming to the fore once again. And uh, it doesn't bode well for us in the terms of sustainable use. In short, that's the basics of the collective SUCO endeavor we would want to convey at this Heritage Press Day, which then also becomes the first steps on the road we as collective have chosen to walk in making our voices heard. This day is about our heritage and traditions, but also to show that our collecti collective SUCO is a voice for the maintenance of an inclusive, economic, sustainable wildlife management regime. For all South Africans is the voice of reason and reality based on an Afrocentric approach to wildlife management to benefit our people. For in the end, only if our people benefit from wildlife will our wildlife survive on the subcontinent. Everywhere in the world where wildlife benefits humans, wildlife thrive. It's all over. There where there's overprotectionism, wildlife means only anything in terms of an emotion. And wildlife has no chance of surviving in posterity under those regimes. And that's proven all over the world. So in short, that's the introduction and welcome again. We will now move over to the presentation by uh, Stephen Polos on the traditions of hunting. Just give us a moment's time, let us just please organize the electronics this side. Bear with us, we'll be there now. First, I need this near the speaker of the, of the computer just to play the sound through.
right, sorry, that was just meant to be a little bit of an introduction. Uh, Going to need some arrowheads. Indeed we are. Uh, that was our uh, ancestors from some time ago, uh, down a line somewhere, I guess. Thank you, Jack Black, for showing us the way. Um, where did we find the oldest arrowheads ever discovered in, in, from antiquity? And that was right here in South Africa. 61,700 years old estimate found in South Africa. Now, isn't that heritage? I'm Stephen Palos, as Dr. Herman Els introduced me. I was raised a hunter. Uh, actually, my, my upbringing was from, obviously, from my father and my uncles. And that was actually as a wing shooter, mostly because part of my heritage uh, comes from the Cypriot Greek side. And that is a thing that is quite big amongst the Mediterranean community generally, is the heritage of wing shooting. It's quite common still in Greece, Cyprus parts of Italy, Spain, and Portugal. So that was my beginnings of my hunting heritage, was as a humble wing shooter uh, in my youth. But one of his other friends from his childhood introduced me to what I called real hunting at the time as a youngster, when I went on my first rifle hunt to shoot an Impala back in the day, it was 1982. Now that's something that is in etched into my memory as now I'm into my deep 50s. And is this not the stuff of which heritage is forged? The things you remember from your youth and which you've carried from your father, from your uncles, your grandfather, and so on down through the lines. In this presentation, I can hardly scrape the surface of hunting heritage. But maybe just prickle a little bit of your interest in this short presentation. For those of you who do not have a hunting background, who might be watching this, you might be able to get some sense of just how deep and, 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 and uh, important the hunting heritage is in humankind. We're talking a period spanning right back to antiquity, hundreds of thousands of years in our current form as human, as human beings, uh, and obviously so far back that it's the, the oldest parts of it that we have found hardly even go back to the beginnings. Yeah, we have, as old as hunting in some of the, um, we have, yeah, some of the oldest known rock art, which specifically depicts hunting. You're talking, this was discovered in the Sul Sulawesi district of Indonesia in about 2017. Dated at a minimum age of 44,000 years ago. It could be quite a lot older because they can't obviously date the actual painting itself, but what they dated was actually remnants of, um, of microbes that were between the rock and the paint, which they assumed were captured there at the time. Um, this is celebrating hunting as far back as 44,000 years ago in our pedigree. Um, one of the, the things that is very important about hunting is that it was almost certainly the reason family groups formed up and stayed together in our history. It was probably what then led to the smallest of early tribes and eventually, obviously, onto slightly bigger cultural groups and, and uh, kept the people together, so to speak. It was a unifier of people. Clearly, if it was important enough to record it on rock art, hunting must have been a very profound activity for those early humanoids. But even today, hunters are still creating more stories and recording them. So if you think about that, the stories told on those rocks and the stories we tell each other as hunters today are not very different from each other. That's what we have to, co to co converse about as human beings. Obviously, there are a lot of artifacts that are much older that prove our hunting prowess. For example, arrowheads, stone arrowheads, etc., that have survived much, much older than what the rock art has, which again is proof of how early on in our uh, uh, origins the hunting was, was profound in our lives. And these are essentially celebrations of what people were doing at that time. Just think of another thing that's old in our heritage, and that's the beat of music, and probably the first tentative dance steps that people took. What would have caused people to beat a drum, beat sticks together, and eventually start tapping their toes? I would beg to argue that probably it was successful hunts, or possibly a hunt that didn't go the right way that would have brought out such nostalgia in the people at the time. So I'm prepared to bet, and I'm not a scientist on this, but I'm giving an anecdotal view on the subject, that the first dance and the first music probably 
Stephen from the first hands. By the dawning of what we would call true civilizations, civilizations that were forming around the eons of uh, the, the early Minoans, obviously the Aztec civilizations, the Eastern civilizations that were forming, hunting started to become a very central theme in humankind's life. There are a few examples of how the ancients glorified hunting. So apart from our own heritage in the African context, I want to put this up before I get into that. And here we have from all around the globe, the early heritage of hunting in terms of civilization. You've got North American there at the top. You've got a Greek Minoan theme there on the, uh, on the vase, probably Cretan. You've got the Persian theme. You've got the Central Americas uh, there in the center. And then you've got from the east, and then uh, obviously a British scene there, in the, or a, 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 a very English-looking scene in the middle there with the lances and the boars, and then of course the, the Roman style in the bottom. So these were early civilizations glorifying hunting, and obviously that carried on until this present day. But every major religion, every major culture, every major creed has it, had its hunting rights, and their customs and their beliefs, all relative to hunting and the use they uh, and, and, and the, the sustenance that it gave. There were gods, there were fables, and the hunter was always glorified as the provider and the protector. Even in Aesop's fables, there's much reference to, to hunting and, and, and the glory of hunting. There's a famous opening verse of, a, of the poem, Vaderman's Hail, the hunter's salute, by Oscar van Riesenthal. He was an ornithologist and the royal forester of Charlottenburg, which was a part of Prussia in our journey until the late 1800s. And this opening verse of this poem appears on the well-known Jagermeister label to this day. Its English translation is roughly, this is the hunter's shield of honor that he protects and fosters his game. Hunts like a huntsman as it should be. Honors the creator in the creature. That is the hunter's creed which dates back to Prussian times as an example of the European or the Eurocentric uh, heritage of hunting. I have a personal favorite out of the Eurocentric, and I think it was because I was very, very blessed to visit this particular site. This is Matthias's fountain at Buddha Castle. I can tell you this, this scene is absolutely awe-inspiring. If you stand alongside this and look up at that, um, it's, it's unbelievably fantastic to see in, in real life. Matthias was a king of, of, uh, of um, Hungary from 1458 to 1490, and he was a keen huntsman, amongst other things. He was a unifier, and he was quite a respected leader of, of that era, uh, in, in that area of the world. Um, you see there, he stands at the top with a crossbow in his hands. He's got his hounds, his houndsmen below him. He's got the horn, the hunter's horn being blown. He has a falconer to the one side. He has um, a mythical love of his life. There's a story about um, Fair Helen. Uh, on the side, she's sitting with a fawn at her, at her uh, side as a protector. But an interesting side issue that I'd like to touch on here, in terms of the branch of hunting, you'll see on the left-hand side of the picture the falcon, the falcon sitting on the arm of the uh, of the the one courtier there. Now, falconry is a very interesting branch of hunting. Uh, it's actually described as an art, the the art of falconry, highly specialised, and it takes very dedicated activity in, in the space. And falconry was actually de declared, the art of falconry was declared by UNESCO as an international intangible human heritage activity. This is a very important activity uh, uh, status to achieve because you now have falconry basically protected by United Nations protocol as a heritage activity. Um, interestingly, at the time that this occurred, the International Federation for Falconry was presided over by a South African uh, at the time, and that person in actual fact is very active within our SUCO uh, structures as well. We're very blessed to have such, such wisdom and such able people with us. Now to Africa. This is where we are uh, most interested. Obviously Africa, and in particular South Africa, is the cradle of humankind. So it was also obviously the cradle of hunting. It was from here that we emanated out into the rest of the world many, many eons ago. And obviously the most celebrated of African hunters remain our sand people, 
Their prolific lo rock art obviously preserved much of their hunting prowess, but the fact of the matter is that they are still to this day amongst our best known hunters and active hunters, with many of their descendants still living their traditional lives in the Kalahari region, some of the most difficult regions of, of the world to live in, and very successfully carrying on with their own hunting traditions and working as guides, trackers, and even storytellers within the current hunting uh, uh, commercial sphere of, of things. There's nothing more exciting than to attend a hunt where uh, sand uh, folk are part of the guide and tracking uh, of that particular operation. And they do it on a very, very interesting and very sustainable basis. Obviously, the rock art is found extensively in, South Af in Africa itself, tre tremendously so in, in the southern parts of Africa, which is believed to be the cradle of humankind, all up the east coast, and then there's pockets, of course, in the, in the northern parts of Africa. It's odd that the west side is not prolific in rock art, but I would suspect that mostly that is because of a lack of actually exploration in those areas more than the lack of there actually being anything there. But of course, it wasn't just the sand. In Africa, everybody was a hunter. Every single group, every tribe, everybody had an interest in hunting. And there are many pictures and photo, even early photos, paintings uh, of the exploits of all of Africa's people as hunters. Um, the migrating societies met and interacted, obviously. Um, sometimes there was clashes, sometimes there was cooperation in trade, and hunting was very central to all of this. The early European explorers and missionaries sought hunting privileges from local chiefs and kings as part and parcel of their access into Africa at the time. And obviously this did take its toll on game at the time because it was the start of, let's say, the market hunting mindset of these late 1700s and the 1800s. And um, there, there was definitely a, a decline in game numbers in parts. And you could, if you read the old explorers, you'll see how much further each subsequent explorer had to go before he found the kind of game numbers that, that were once here. But luckily, this also re led the way towards the first conservation, not just here in Africa, but it was, it was happening simultaneously in the United States, for example, where the first game reserve started to get proclaimed, and the first preservation of game numbers started. And it's not for nothing that these were called game reserves. It was driven by the hunters to preserve animals, and game, of course, was the target. We were concerning ourselves with the huntable species. So it was early hunters that started the turnaround towards conservation efforts uh, 120 to 150 odd years ago. Um, in the last 70 years, uh, you've seen a phenomenal resurgence, as Doc Els has already touched on, and I'm sure that will come out more in what they have to say. As the, the turn from being a, a um, commodity-driven hunter in towards being a recreational conservation hunter evolved in the modern era. Hunting heritage, of course, suffered amongst African people in this era as well because you had the preservationist policies of the, the Eurocentric, mostly Western-driven, colonialist in nature type of preservation policies. And that tended to replace the people with the wildlife. You had forced removals and that type of thing. And the, the whole concept is rather than live with and benefit from the wildlife, those policies separated the people from their resource, from their sustenance and from their heritage. It's very crucial here yeah, in South Africa in the modern era now that we recognize this. And those communities that have been granted land back must also be granted with that the right to prosper from the utilization of that wildlife. It's pointless giving them the land and leaving them poor on it because of draconian legislation that tells them not to touch the game. We are world leaders now in, in South Africa in wildlife management practices, and Gerard will speak to that just now. And mo we are more than able to mentor these new land or these restu restituted landowners to a wholly sustainable model for their prosperity and for, and for conservation at the same time. And this will be a core concern of SUCO SA going forward, is to ensure that communities that get restitution certainly get the benefit of the, the wildlife there in a sustainable long-term fashion. But where are we now? It was the cow and the plow that changed the world forever. If you ever look, that tells us the story of the industrial era, the industrialization era. The advent of agriculture on a commercial scale 
which started only some 12,000 years ago. Agriculture is a tiny pin drop in our history as humankind, given against, for example, the practices of hunting, music and dance. But it's made a massive difference in humanity. The mega farming operations and monocultures, which also, of course, fed the Industrial Revolution, has put us in a scenario now where the vast majority of people, especially in the developed world, are urbanized. Food gets brought to people. And now there's a disconnect. People are disconnected from their food source. That has led to a new, a, a kind of a disconnect that now leaves us, the hunters, those of us who still understand these things, very different to the urban folk who are against it. The urban folk become voyeurs. They want to look at wildlife, not as participants. They're happy to look at it through the glass of a car, for example, or on a TV screen. So they disconnect themselves from wildlife and nature, but they've got tremendous influence. It's like looking into a goldfish bowl to watch the goldfish, where we, the hunter, wants to go swim with the dolphin. That's the difference. But that is their sadness and their loss. But unfortunately, they now seek to impose that on us. And that's what we need to deal with. We cannot allow the urban um, and influential few, by the way, they're not the majority, they just seem like the majority because of social media and the access. We cannot allow them to impose their thoughts upon us. We do not want that as our world, those scenes on the right. We want the world that we still believe in. So, what are we going to do of it? We are many. There are very, very many of us. The, the, rur the rural communities of the world, although we don't have the louder voice at this stage, are still the majority. We are right in our approach. We are not wrong. It's right because it's our world others are seeking to change. They should fix theirs first before changing ours. If you prickle a hunting instinct in a child, it takes flight and it soars. I am a hunter. My eyes face forward, like the cats, the canines and the eagles. They are not stuck on the sides of my head, like the hare, the antelope or the canaries. I'm not built naturally to be a seed eater by design. I'm built as a meat eater. And as a meat eater, I choose to be a predator, not a scavenger. I will take personal responsibility for the harvesting of my own meat, rather than eat the animals killed elsewhere by others on my behalf. I will share these values with my own people and have done so. It has forged a family unit as close and strong as it has done for, for, for humankind for eons already. We share fireside stories with fellow hunters, as has been our heritage for many hundreds of thousands of years. That is what we are. That is our heritage, and we will defend and protect that. So, as Suka is a... We are a coalition of philosophically like-minded folk who will ensure the natural scheme of things prevails in a world desperately in need of, of old-fashioned good sense. A message today as we approach Heritage Day to every anti-hunting zealot out there, what you should consider with due appreciation that for many thousands of years of their own personal evolutionary journey in the, in, in the history of that particular anti-hunting zealot, there were able hunters in your lineage. For if not, you wouldn't be here today. We need to secure that heritage into the future. This is our values. This is what we believe in. And I'm about to hand over to my colleagues who will expand on the benefits, the technical reasons, what is the right way to go, and how we're going to deal with each other as Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Can we take uh, a five minute or seven minute break for us just to set up the other thing and then we'll go from there.
Okay, uh, good morning to you all, to um, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Um, it's a real privilege to be here with you this morning and uh, to present to you wildlife ranching in South Africa. I think it's time to tell the good story. It's time to hear the good story. And uh, we hear all bad stories always, and some of the bad stories are always sensational. But I think it's time that we back ourselves uh, in South Africa. We've got a wonderful industry. And um, I want you to go through with me through all these slides quickly. Uh, I know it's a short time, it's only 20 minutes, uh, so we will run through quite quickly. But uh, uh, afterwards, uh, I believe we will be able to answer some questions. Harold, let me just, sorry, I apologize. Let me just get the, the microphone on for, for, uh, for the Zoom feed. No, it is. That's fine. Uh, I want to run through this slideshow quickly uh, and I will go through this what will save wildlife uh, for the future hands on and hands off what's important and, and what's not important uh, to do for our future our heritage going forward um, I will go through a few points uh, we will start with the development goals and uh, you can go on the development goals, international uh, development goals, there's 17 international development goal, goals from the United Nations. Um, and and if, you, if we look at all these goals, we will see that we fit in as wildlife ranching. We fit in the, one of these, um, uh, some of these uh, goals we fit in. And if we go to number 15, you can go on this, you will see, okay. Uh, if you see, if we look at number 15, some things that they, they ask from us, some things we can do to help in, include recycling, eating a local based diet that is sustainable, sourced and consuming only what we need. And then important, we must be respectful towards wildlife and only take part in ecotourism opportunities that are responsibly and ethically run in order to prevent wildlife disturbance. So this is the view of, of the United Nations. This is the view, the international view. Now there's already 160 countries that signed this and that, that will uh, take the, all these principles through to their countries to work towards 2030. So I'm just giving you an overview so that you understand where we are. 
Now, we've got some challenges, um, and we know we've got some international challenges. Why, why are we in a difficult situation? It's plain basic uh, that the, the, the wildlife industry in South Africa is doing something different, totally different. If you compare wildlife ranching in South Africa to the rest of Africa, we're doing something totally different, and we will come to that one. Um, if you look at this, we've got consum consumption, the great uh, acceleration. We all know what it's all about. Uh, a lot of people in, in the world, a lot of people in South Africa, and it's about to satisfy everybody's need, but not every, everyone's greed. And we must remember that one. To satisfy everyone's need, but not everyone's greed. And you will see a little bit further on why I'm saying this. Um, the, the, all the buzzwords that's running at the moment, um, worldwide, if you look at these things, the socio-economic trends, you will see all the consumption levels. I will just run quickly through, I just want to show you the two. Primary energy use, you can see the consumption and fertilizer consumption, you can see it's sky high. So you can see all the other socio-economic trends as well. Thank you. And then the earth system trends, we can see the two year tropical forest loss. You can see where we are um, just over 2000, 2010, and where we are now 2020. And then you can also look at the terrestrial uh, biosphere de degradation. Just look at that. Everything is going up, 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 up. And that's the big concern. And that's the perception in the world. And that's why we've got um, the 17 principles to run towards 2030. Uh, 30. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and just to explain this, this is a, a very nice picture actually. You can see the economy on top. You can see the society there. And then at the bottom, the biosphere. And you will understand just now why I'm showing you this. Of course, it's very important what we do here at the bottom. Okay. Uh, the other thing that's, that's worrying is uh, the other buzzword is the carbon emissions going up and up and up, and we need to take that down. That is a, a, a next big thing or that, that's uh, at the moment uh, going on. Okay. And then we all know global temperatures. Uh, this is just to explain what's going on. Uh, the last few years since 1970 is going up and up and up and everyone in the world is talking about that one. Okay? And then again, towards sustainable development, the more you develop, the more you develop, the uh, uh, ecological footprint per capita is bigger. South Africa is around about here. So you can see the African countries, we all eat down here. So the more you develop Europe, America, the higher it will be the carbon footprint uh, to bring that down there. So, and then we all know what happened with COVID. Um, we can see just to show you a few things, 16,000 grounded planes. Yes. And we can see uh, trends show that the overall number of travelers decreased by 71% between 19, uh, 2019 and 2020. And we all know what happened then. Instead of 21.8 million visitors, there were only 6.4 million. And that is, that is to, to any country. That is terrible and dreadful. That is, you just want to run away because there's no money. You're not making any money and we're in a very difficult situation. And then the other thing that's going forward, you will see the 7.8 billion people at the moment in the world and at the end of this month it will be 7.9 billion and we can see the population growth is a real worrying factor. This will not disappear easily. If we look at Nigeria, Nigeria will grow in 1950 to 800 million people. Only Nigeria. So South Africa, I'm not South Africa, Africa there will be a, a, a billion more people in the next 30 to 35 years. Thank you. Uh, great. If we look at, at uh, how we must position ourselves, now 
recently we had a high level panel discussion about the five aquatic species and we will look a little bit into that. So again, we will ask the question, uh, what will grow the wildlife economy, hands on and hands off, let's have a look. And you will see there we've got the protected areas in South Africa. It's around about 8%, maybe just a little bit over 8%. Uh, we were supposed to be at 18% this year. Uh, we didn't manage that. So if you look at the protected areas in South Africa, we as wildlife ranching say, hands off, hands off. Why? Protect the national heritage also in those areas. And then if we look at uh, the problems that we've got with um, places like protected areas like Kruger National Park, they employ a lot of people. Uh, and that is not in the Kruger National Park, that is in and around the Kruger National Park. And around the Kruger National Park, there is 3.4 million people. Now the problem is, you need to pay those salaries, but you need COVID, and it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable if you haven't got customers that can support the protected areas. Yeah. Then, if you go a little bit further, big problem that we've got, 44.4% people without uh, jobs in South Africa, that's a real threat. Uh, also for us in the wildlife industry and we need to change this around as soon as possible. And then wildlife outside of protected areas uh, has to compete with the other agricultural uh, sectors. You, you can see them here, so a lot of them. And then you will see that wildlife ranching in South Africa, we're not included in this. We're excluded because we're not and uh, the government, we're not rec recognized as an agricultural uh, commodity at the moment. So we're not even part of this. So we need to go and, and earn that spot for ourselves and for our heritage going forward. Yeah. And then if you look at uh, uh, new studies coming out, I, we are very excited about this. And we, want, we want all of you, national, international, so have a look at these things coming out uh, within the next few months. Uh, what's, what's the difference between uh, the single land use and, and if you look at the diverse economy portfolio that we use in wildlife ranching. You can see the different uh, uh, um, uh, growth. It's 2.7% return on your investment and on a single land use it is a 3 to 4.4%. Uh, uh, jobs, it's per 100 hectare, it's 0.3. Uh, for single land use and for the diverse economic portfolio, it's two to seven percent. These statistics will come out now. The problem that we've got, the marketing that we do and the, 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 the science around the wildlife industry is still new. And we, and we need to put this out for everyone to see. Of course, this is what's making the difference going forward and to protect our heritage. If you look at this, we're already at 17.9% wildlife ranching in South Africa. Now remember the 8% of the protected areas and remember then the United Nations, the 17 principles, they want to move to a 30% protected areas to in 2030, 30%. So if we combine, and that's what we, we're saying to government, if you combine that and you acknowledge the good work that you, you get in wildlife ranching and you put that with the 8% already, we're almost at 30%. Guys, right? acknowledge us. Acknowledge what wildlife ranching is doing in South Africa. And acknowledge the spot. This is very positive. This is one of the best models. It's the best model for wildlife ranching in in the world, not in South Africa or in Africa, in the world, okay? Um, then we've got the pillars of an agroecological uh, certification scheme that we're busy with. This one is coming out, like I just said. Must have a look at this. Uh, this will explain a lot what we're busy with. And we need to clarify, quantify uh, what we're doing in South Africa, okay? uh, If you look at this, Next one, look at this. If we want to grow the wildlife economy, we need to outperform 
other land use options. And if you think back now earlier, remember what I show you, the, the, how many people we give jobs and, and, and what we do and the growth that you can get in wildlife, it's something to think of because we can, we can do this on marginal land. Some of the areas in South Africa, most of the 17.9% is marginal land. It's not productive land. So we can, we can even enhance this and take it to another 10 million acres where we can put wildlife on, on marginal land. That's the, that's the real possibility and positive out of this. And then just a few slides, if you read this, 97% 90, of Orobi are found on private owned uh, farmland. Now think, think for yourself now back to what is the main aim, the main aim of the 17 principles is to do rewilding, is to uh, create bigger protected areas to move towards the, uh, um, 20, 30 to a 30%. Remember that one, and then we go back and see what wildlife ranching is doing. Remember we work with uh, soil, water, and air. And then we work with animals. So if, if we're not careful with the biodiversity and the habitat protection, then we're in trouble. So actually what I'm saying to you is that you protect the habitat and the whole biodiversity from bees, reptiles, animals, plants, shrubs, grass, everything on your property. And that is the real benefit. And that is what we're already doing in South Africa, and that's just what we're proud of. Proud of. Uh, run to the next one, 88% of Wonderbog are found on private owned uh, farmland. Next one. 95% run antelope are found on privately owned farmland. Next one. 87% of black wildebeest are found on privately owned farmland, and only 13% of national game reserves. 97% uh, of sable antelope are found on privately owned farmland. Only 3% on national game reserves. 90% blessed bog, privately owned. 65%, might be 60%. I'm not sure about that one now, uh, found on privately owned farmland. And if we just look at this, and if you just look at this, then I would like to ask the question. If we are an alternative, if you look what will happen in the next 50 years. Because there's one difference, I will get to that difference, remember that one. I will get to that one now. There's one difference uh, if you look at the model in South Africa compared to the other countries. Okay, thank you, Dries. If you look at the renewable and sustainable uh, um, gold of Africa, this is at Mapungubwe, you can see that uh, little rhino there. We've got gold people that we can work with. It's the heritage of South Africa, game that we've got in South Africa. And that is what we need to tell the world. Guys, don't crucify us for that. It's time for you to smell the coffee and sit up straight and see what we're doing. And, and help us to enhance this and help us to uh, give benefits to the communities and to the people in South Africa. Excellent. If you look at this, you can see what happened with the rhinos. Uh, the moment that we stop hunting, it's going down. The moment that you stop hunting, it's going down. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, then, then it's also important for us, like the extra 10 million actors that we want to do in South Africa, um, we want to, to uh, create opportunities for the communities, for people, and we need to transform the industry to the next 10 million actors. Also, we must transform our businesses. We must transform our way of thinking and doing, and we must transform the way that we uh, present ourselves to the world. So we, we, we want you to see what we're doing, and you want, want, we want you to put this in the newspaper and in the media so that people can see what is happening in South Africa and tell the good story of wildlife ranching. Um, then the influence uh, on government, it's really important because we need to quantify and qualify ourselves and take it also to government and work with government on certain issues. Uh, for an example, look at this one. This is very important. If you look at this number of lines shot per year, 
I'm getting to my point now. It's not sustainable, can you see that? Tanzania, and you also can, you can also look at Kenya, the last 40 years, they've lost 80% of the game. Can you see that it's not sustainable? The hunting of elephant, the hunting of lions. Why? If you look at this, you must stop all hunting. Why is it like this? There's no management. Plain and simple. Wildlife ranching is a model that you manage. If you don't manage the model, and you don't take, take care of your animals, this is what's happened. That's why we're so successful in South Africa. So everyone that would like to use this against wildlife ranching in South Africa, the model that we use, why is you wrong? Of course, we can show you figures. We can show you the animals, the enhanced animal species and population from 500,000 to maybe 14 million at the moment. So that's why we say we can prove that, we can show that, okay? Uh, then, um, just to show you member societies, if you look at the green areas, they're all member societies. And if you look and you can, if you can enlarge this, you will see all the small islands here. You can see all the small places. Everyone has got a vote at Cyprus. 183 countries. Next one, this. If you look at this, the, the only countries with rhinos, you can see them there. And most of the rhinos, you will find only here in South Africa. Then we vote at Cyprus. You don't understand what we're doing. We're saving these animals. But you're killing us. If we must vote at Cyprus. We're killing the trade on rhinos and rhino horns. It's a renewable product. We need to do that. This is Africa. It's not Europe. It's not America. It's Africa. This is how we work. If we don't do it this way, we're gone. Remember that one. It's different. Please come to us. Come, let me let us show you what we're doing, how we rewild, how we go about to save these animals. There you can get the bigger picture. You can see it. We're outnumbered, totally outnumbered. But look at the facts, and then you will, you will change your, your attitude maybe a little bit. Uh, trade bans, paving the way to extinction. Guys, keep on trade bans, keep on talking about not hunting. This is what will happen. It's already happening. This is what happened in the Kruger National Park the last nine years. We've lost 67% of rhinos there. Privately owned, there's better protection. You take care of the animals and you manage your animals. That's why we're so successful in South, South Africa. You manage your animals. You buy and sell from each other. You've got good quality. We've got the best quality in Africa. Okay, and these things. And then the biggest threat to wildlife in the future uh, is the mis uh, uh, misperception uh, of well-meaning people who are emotionally and financially exploited by NGOs. There is, there is no such thing than emotion in wildlife. If, 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 I, if I must do this on my property, then I must go back to crop farming because there will be no means for me or no ways for me to make a living and to carry on in South Africa. And then, and then you will just destroy the 17.9% privately protected areas in South Africa. So you do this, you kill the animals. Come to Africa, come to South Africa, come and have a look for yourself. Next one. And then we decided it's time, we're a little bit far behind, if you look at face in Europe already, the 40 years uh, old, I must say 40 years young, ACI already, uh, many years old, and, and if you look at South Africa, it's time for us also to stand together. And, and we're actually very excited about SUCO. For the first time, we can say the hunters and we all work together. And we're looking forward to the future working together. And I think uh, we make a big difference in the next year or two. Just to tell the story to the world, it's time to do that. It's time to protect our heritage. And then we ask the question, if your organization is not part of this initiative, Maybe you should ask them why. Why? Let's let's protect our heritage. That is that is what we must do. Thank you, please.
And the last thing, the last one I want to say, I want you to listen carefully to this, and then I'm finished. Please help us to tell the good story highlighting the sustainable success of wildlife ranching in South Africa that has transformed and rewilded our country already, already, we already at 2030. Acknowledge that. Already there. Enhanced species and secured populations ensure the protection of our biodiversity, all for the benefit of our people in South Africa. We need to give more jobs, people. That's it. We need to give it to our people as well. Help us protect our heritage by telling this fascinating and successful story. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, so thank you, thank you very much, Haran. Thank you for that presentation. We'll take another five-minute break, uh, and then we'll, we'll have the last presentation. Ik zie nooit dat ik denk dat er is aan ons.
Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the last presentation. Uh, 
before we'll take some questions on this issue. And this is about our right to speak. We have earned the right to speak. You've heard Stephen Paulos saying that we have a right as hunters because that's where we come from. You've heard Gerard Heineke to say that because of what we've achieved in wildlife ranching in this country, we have the right to say and we have the right to be included when policy decisions are taken in terms of wildlife in this country and not to be excluded. To us, the biggest threat in managing our wildlife and ascertaining the sustainable use and continuance of the numbers of wildlife in South Africa is the green agenda. And as Stephen has shown you and as Gerard has shown you, the numbers of these people are small and they are totally, use the word, the word devoid of nature because they sit in cities and they are bombarded with Walt Disney and National Geographic. And that's why people get killed in this country when they get out of cars in the lion park because National Geographic says that the lion has a name and the lion is not aggressive and people get out to take pictures with the lions and then they get killed and then they don't understand why. The wildlife is in this country and the record of this country in terms of preserving and protecting and growing wildlife is phenomenal. My youngest son says assumption is the mother of all balls ups. He uses a stronger word, but I can't put that up there. And indeed it is so. Unfortunately, the majority of people are quick to assume the meaning of things upon first glance without really caring to know or find out the real truth or facts of a specific matter. The assumption, burn the ivory stock, the piles of ivory stock to show the world and the black market that ivory is actually worthless. In Kenya, they burned 12 tons in 1989 and 15 tons in 2016. That gives you 27 tons of ivory burned. Yet on the black market, ivory sells for 1,800 US dollars per kilogram. 27 tons of burnt ivory, which is a loss to conservation, and that's just the ivory. Forget the elephant, is somewhere in the region of 48,6 million US dollars. That translates into roughly 695 South African million rand. Conservatively, on average, a tusk of an elephant is 40 pounds. It's very conservative because they go from 20 to 100. So let's stay, for argument's sake, at 40 pounds per tusk. If you look, look at the tusks on that picture, you'll see that they are most probably heavier. The tusks of one elephant would thus represent 80 pounds of ivory. That means 27 tons of ivory represents more than 744 poached elephants. The burning of ivory constitutes one of the biggest crimes ever committed against conservation with utter disrespect for the lives of 744 elephants which had to be killed to get to the ivory. We have it on good authority that Kenya and the DRC got the money for that ivory from pressure groups and green groups in America. In other words, it was not just a question of burning and that Kenya and the DRC had the initiative of burning this, but it was because of green pressure from Euro-American centered animal rights groups. The, the disgrace continues. Scales of one mature giant pangolin weighs 3,6 kilogram. In the DRC, they burnt 1,2 tons of pangolin skins. That gives you 333 animals. The question is, where's the respect for these animals? And what did you achieve? You did not close the black market. All that you did was you made the syndicate bosses more and more wealthy 
because it means that the stock which they have in their possession is worth more. On that picture is 81 elephants, you can take my word for it. 744 elephant is nine times that picture. But actually, most probably 744 elephants of that size with the tusks. Because in the picture we have babies, or, or then calves and mothers, but cows with, with smaller tusks. The decline in the elephant population in Sub-Saharan Africa came from an estimated 8 million in the 1850s to 415,000 today. I'm never sure about figures like this because who was around in 1850 to count the elephant to say that they were 8 million? But let's live with that. The same in about 1890 or, or 1900 to say that there were 5 million. But again, let's live with that. If the numbers are correct, 5,6 million elephants were killed in 100 years an average of 56,000 per animal, or 153 animals per day. Remember in this time, the elephant hunting was a big industry. And big hunters, which have written books, a lot of these people that we read about today, so like Sibu, were all elephant hunters, and ivory was a big income source. Ivory was also a big income for the ZAR, or the Zeit Afrikaanse Republic, of Umpol Kruger. But in the 1950s, conservation started to take new and, and people started to uh, protect, uh, protect the areas and started to try and protect these in animals better. But in the 70 years between 1950 and 2020, we still lost nearly 2 million elephants due to poaching. In that 20 years, between 1960 and 1980, we lost 600,000 elephants at an average of 20 animals per animal, 55 animals per day. And between 1990 and 2020, we lost 185,000 elephants due to poaching. 12,300 animals per animal at 53 animals per day. So you want to come now and tell us that Ivory is worthless. Uh, I think you, it needs a rethink. So there's the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUU, an international body comprising of many highly intellectual scientists who had compiled the report in 2020. They say that there are around 450,000 elephants in total in Africa today. Savannah elephants have declined by 60% over the last 50 years. That's 1970. So, one elephants are the elephants that we get in South Africa or you get in Kenya or Tanzania. The forest elephants are, are the elephants which you get more in forested areas and the wooded areas of, of Central Africa. And they say that we lost 86% of those animals in the past 30, 31 years from 1989. And apparently, the reason for that is, is that the ivory of the forest elephant has a pinkish hue. And it is also much harder than the ivory of the savannah elephant and therefore calves easier. If you want to call it, it works easier. They go on to say, several African countries have led the way in recent years, proving that we can reverse elephant declines and we must work together to ensure their example can be followed. Unfortunately, they don't say where these countries are, who these countries are, that we whose example must be followed. They also say we must urgently put an end to poaching and ensure that sufficient suitable habitat for both forest and savanna elephants is conserved. No mention of who must stop the poaching. Why must we stop the poaching now in 2020? Why haven't the people that are screaming about the poaching and about the elephant numbers and don't hunt elephants and all of those kind of things, why haven't they stopped the poaching a long time ago? In Africa, developing countries just don't have the funding for it. Or, give us an explanation of how more suitable habitat will stop poaching. If we've lost 60% of the elef savannah elephant and we've lost 86% of the forest elephant, 
Why would we need more land to protect it? I say again, these are highly intellectual scientists. And we have to acknowledge that, that they are people of intellect. In addition to the ongoing threat of poaching, many populations of elephants are also under threat from hunting and the degradation of their habitat as grasslands and forests are turned over to crops and grazing. The question is, where are these many populations of elephants which are under threat from hunting? This you're a professional hunter, where, do they, where are these elephant populations under threat? Not in, southern, not in southern Africa. The degradation of the habitat as grasslands and forests are turned over to crops and grazing. They don't say where this happens, it's a generalization, and that's the dilemma with these kind of reports. And they are scientists. Facts are not prevalent in these reports. The anomaly is that in 1995, 43% of all sub-Saharan African elephants were in southern Africa. 2005, 60%, 2019, 73%. And that's the growth in elephant numbers in Botswana since 1975. And these figures are not a thumbs up. They are derived from peer-reviewed scientific publications. Estimated carrying capacity of elephant is 60,000. So you understand what that means? That it means that in, in, to have equilibrium and counting all of the animals and wildlife which is dependent on an habitat, in this habitat where we have elan and blue wildebeest and impala and daker and, and tortoises, we can carry 60,000 elephant to have a decent equilibrium of keeping the habitat intact in Botswana. But in the 10 years between 2002 and 2012, there was a 68,7% in the growth of the elephant population in Botswana. If we say that there was just a 50% growth of elephant, of the elephant population between 2012 and 2022, we get to a figure of 311,000. That's next year. Experts will tell you that the probability is, is, is that the population might have doubled. That figure of 311,000 is already five times the estimated carrying capacity of Botswana. And this means that in 2022, 75% of sub-Saharan Africa's elephants will be in Botswana. Because remember, we've got 450,000 elephants in sub-Saharan Africa. Now the rest is in South Africa, Zambia, Tanzania, Namibia, Angola. Will the massive overpopulation of elephants in Botswana eventually result in this? That's a question we must ask. Because elephants destroy everything just because of the mass of food they need every day. Total habitat collapse, collapse due to the detriment of all biodiversity because of elephants have destroyed it all. That's a situation of five times estimated carrying capacity. The harrowing thing about this is that these pictures were not taken in Botswana. They were taken in the Kruger National Park, which is fast becoming the Kruger Elephant Park. All indications are, elephant, look, elephant numbers in the Kruger National Park is just a big a secret as the uh, uh, nuclear development program of the previous government. That secret is unbelievably secure. But people who understand these things tend to tell us that the carrying capacity of the Kruger National Park is between six and 8,000 elephants, and that we are closing onto 40,000 elephants in Kruger National Park. That already also gives us a five times estimated larger population than the carrying capacity. We can also ask, Will the massive overpopulation of elephants in Botswana eventually result in this? Experts on elephant management say this is a, these were signs of starvation. Rather than microbes and stuff like that in water that killed these elephants in Botswana recently. You will remote, remember there was an uproar about that. Let us just play this.
before the person, the commentator said, showed you the picture of the stunt that we'll find, which is as a result of thousands, these words are thousands and thousands of them created this in Botswana. And he says, this is a travesty in terms of our heritage. If not total habitat collapse, who will take responsibility to cull more than 100,000 elephants in an effort to try and slow down total habitat destruction? The question has to be asked, haven't we passed the stage in Botswana where we must now rather let elephant and the total biosphere or habitat they are dependent on totally collapse with all other wildlife, because they will as well, and then wait for another 30 years or 40 years for this to happen so that we can have a new start in Botswana. Luckily, I don't have to take that decision. But remember, if you cull, you cull family groups of elephants. And any person who thinks that the guys who are on this picture enjoy that job makes a massive mistake. Because if you, sh if you take or cull a breeding herd, you shoot from the calves all the young elephant as well as the female elephants. And if you think it's for pleasure, running around in the morning shooting 30 or 40 elephant with a 4-5 lot with a bullet as thick as my thumb I've got a, a message for you, it can't be pleasant, a, a pleasant. Remember, cutting implies killing a whole breeding herd at a time, as I told you. But in the words of Walt Disney and National Geographic cunning will be killing all of these baby elephants their young sisters and brothers and their mothers in one morning. And most probably all of these elephants, according to Walt Disney and National Geographic, all have names. Indeed, it's a powerful humanizing message when so presented totally out of context. But as a result of this continuous out of context message, telling has to be an option in Botswana because of the pressure of green groups and, 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 and scientists, culling was not executed in Botswana and we've got the numbers which we have now. This photo of 81 elephants, 100,000 elephants, that, that picture is 1,255 times that picture. It is a bloodbath. How do you do it? How will you manage culling of 100,000 elephants? Then we must ask, how factually correct, relevant, and realistic is this protest there? <coughs> Granted, this protest was against trophy imports into Britain, but it's part of elephants. This is a campaign driven under false pretext by misrepresentation and misusing the assumptions and money of gullible people. It borders the ridiculous and could eventually possibly be described as criminal. Why criminal? Wildlife tourism is the third largest industry in Botswana. If elephants destroy the habitat of wildlife in Botswana, a massive part of Botswana's income is down the drain. Who are the people that will lose the most? Elephant? The people in London? people in New York, or the people living in Botswana, in the eastern sections of Botswana, where the population of about 3 million people live. Of course it's the people of Botswana. That's why it's criminal. And from where I sit personally, it's criminal because you have no value attached to animals. The question, these people frequently say that hunters and sustainable use people play God with animals because they decide when to take out animals or when to tell them or when to shoot them. Who's playing God with animals now? May this never be the end result of continuous processes of unrealistic, neo-colonialist, biocentric and protectionist focused elephant management which have been imposed on Botswana by so-called scientists and animal rightists with an eurocentric emphasis for the past 50 years. In this country, we are a little bit okay still, but if the Kruger National Park is being managed and continuously managed in the manner it's done now, 
we might have the same situation there. The story that I know is something different. Very hard work by Dr. Ian Player and his people down in Kluklo and on Polosi in KwaZulu Natal in the period 1950 to 1960 brought back white rhino populations from about 100 animals to 1,000, 1,200. And over time, they grew the population so that they could place some of these uh, rhino into Kruger National Park and also into private hands up to 2005. But after 2005, this is the dramatic decline which we see in rhino numbers in this country. The decline is a direct result of the so-called precautionary approach to the banning of international trade in, trade in rhino oil. Karat told you the same. This despite the rhino horn trade being illegal in China for the past two decades. If you read the report of the scientists of CITES, they are, seem to be satisfied with the fact that the trade has been banned in China. But guys, if the trade is banned, then obviously it should have stopped the poaching. Why is the value of rhino horn so high if there's no trade? Obviously there's a trade. There's always a black market trade. The best place to look at this is in Prohibition. And look at the Kennedy family, which is a very known or well-known family in America. Old man Kennedy was one of the big people who stuck, well we call it Mampur in this country, they call it Munsha. He made millions in Prohibition. So much so that he was later involved in politics and he became appointed as ambassador for America in, in Britain during the war years. His son, John F. Kennedy, became president. His other son became the, uh, the head of the Justice Department. His other son, third son, was very prominent in politics. If prohibition did not work in America, why would banning the trade of anything the IUCN specialist group on rhino indicated these numbers of rhino in 2015 and you see that the vast majority of rhino are in this country or were in this country in 2015, 90% of all white rhino and 36% of all black rhino. The other country with a large number of black rhino you see is Namibia. You'll also see that Namibia and Zimbabwe are the two countries with the highest number of white rhino. But the vast majority of rhino is in this country, and the reason for that is wildlife ranching, and the fact that rhino are in possession with people in, in, on, on wildlife ranches, and we must acknowledge it, that the program in Kruger National Park was fantastically successful. Yet, after the trade ban in 2009, this is the result. More than 8,300 animals were poached with a total loss of 32.3 billion rand. Just in the horn. We must calculate the value we lost in the lives and in the animal itself. That is never calculated. And we must start calculating that. In 2018, one rhino was poached every eight hours. The end result is that the absolute majority of white rhino in South Africa are now in private ownership. But I showed you that slide as well. That's 2019, an estimate decline of 76% in the population in Kruger Park. And that's how it looks in 2020. I apologize for the photo. Uh, it's a little bit grainy, and I can't put it up straight just because of the length of Kruger National Park. But that gives you an idea of the poached carcasses of rhino in the Kruger National Park. The result of the continuous adherence to the so-called precautionary approach to opening the trade in rhino horn. But there's the other side to this, and nobody speaks about this. This is a cost to human lives. Between 2012 and 2016, 261 poachers, or so-called poachers, were killed, and 48 rangers. Guys, that's 60 people per annum killed because of rhino horn. And this is the result. What are we busy with? Who paid for the protection of the rhino in Kruger National Park? People from outside? The people who march in the streets, which Karat showed you that picture? 
or South Africans. We as South Africans pay for that. Not the people from outside. Value of rhino horn in the black market is US dollars about 65,000 per kg, per kilogram. That puts rhino horn at 1,840 per ounce, US dollars. Gold sells at 1,609 US dollars per ounce. That means rhino horn is more valued, valuable than gold. On the other side, these are one of the animals in which the product we can use without having to kill it. And the income derived from this for conservation is massive. One cow can produce 1,82 kgs of horn every two years. And you can make potentially 2 million rand, close to that, on those, on, on 2 kgs of horn. Half it. Make it a million rand. Then those 70 rhinos, one seven rhinos on that picture, means that you can buy annually have an income of 17 million. Can you imagine what the game rancher can do with 17 million in terms of protecting further wildlife areas, rewilding further areas? But can you imagine what sand parks can do? Our question at this stage is we are not sure that if you look at the inventory book of all the horn and ivory that should be in the stock stockpile of sand parks, if that calculates. In other words, that which is in the stockpile and that which is on the books, are they still the same? We tend to think that it's not. And we tend to think that it's one of the biggest problems the minister has in opening the trade, because if you open the trade, which is there, then that becomes the first stockpile you have to sell. And if you open those vault doors and there's nothing in there, what do you tell your people? I don't know. It's conjecture. I've, I've got no facts. So I'm asking these questions. The cost to feed a rhino in private ownership, a person of 21 with, has 21 white rhino in Limpopo, comes to 55,000 rand a month. That's 660,000 rand per annum. This is money coming out of a person's pocket to protect rhinos. And yet we can't trade. The value of these animals for this specific person is in the fact that they are my animals. In other words, there's an emotional attachment. And if this person's money goes down the drain, who's going to buy those rhinos? Because it's no worth. It's not worth buying a rhino. What are you going to do with it? It's got no value. It's better buying 10 blue willoughbys than one rhino because you can at least get down to those blue willoughbys. So the real neocolonialism and biocentric drivers of wildlife and emotion and perceptions are these guys. And we say they are mainly in it for financial gain for themselves and to maintain an own personal lifestyle. You go to cite these conventions, the IUCN conventions and other conventions, and you see where these people stay. And you see how these people buy votes from developing countries' conservation departments to vote in the manner in which they want. Greenpeace has three ocean-going vessels. How much does it cost to buy an ocean-going vessel and maintain it with a crew on it to go all around the world. And what do they achieve? Nothing. The, all they're doing is, is, is they're creating a narrative which is going to kill wildlife all over the world. They function on this paradigm. They function on the paradigm of perception and of the lie and of half-truths. Never on facts. Never on the truth. Because the truth and the fact is not emotionally sellable. Have you ever seen these guys fight for these endangered species? Never. And to us the travesty is that in South Africa we have a vision for a wildlife economy against this background. People in this room sat in a workshop for three weeks in which they eat out a policy how to establish a decent wildlife economy and they came up in the end by saying that what we want 
is a thriving, inclusive, and sustainable wildlife economy for the well-being of all South Africans. Oh, that's fantastic. That's what we want. That's what Gerard said. That's what, what Stephen Paulo said. This is our wildlife. This is our people. This is our country. That is what we would like to have. Give us the opportunity. But, judge against the recent conservation results. I've shown them to you. I've shown them to in, 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 in the mega populations in Africa. I've shown them in Southern Africa. I've shown them in the Peru National Park. But, with, granted, it's the big species, but you work on, on what happens there. And under the protectionist and biocentric wildlife management regime, currently proposed by the Department of Environmental Affairs, with a policy for so-called iconic species coming out of the high-level panel, the future of this ideal is seriously in jeopardy. But we recognize this jeopardy and against our track record as a collective of responsible practitioners of sustainable use of our renewable natural resources and as supporters of an inclusive economic sustainable wildlife management regime for all South Africans, we have as a collective proven that we have earned the right to speak. We have earned the right to speak and we will make certain that it's based on scientific fact and the truth and that, it will be, and that will be the basis of all our collective speak with our right to speak being assured by section 24 of the Constitution. To be heard is a challenge and to be taken as serious fellow travelers in this process is a challenge but we'll achieve that and we'll learn how to do that. We have the right to speak in terms of Section 24 of the Constitution, which says everyone has the right, it's strong words these guys, everyone has the right to an environment that is not harmful to their health or well-being. To have the environment protected for the benefit of present and future generations through reasonable, reasonable legislative and other measures that prevent pollution and ecological degradation. Have you read the press in the past week about all of the uranium wa uh, saturated water coming decanting from the mines in the western parts of the, of the reef. Promote conservation and secure ecologically sustainable development and use of natural resources while promoting justifiable economic and social development. To us, that is the inclusive and economically sustainable wildlife management regime that we stand for. But if you look at the people who are driving the policy, they seem to stop at section 24B2. Seems as if they have not yet read B3. We have earned the right to speak because we brought back the number of ban on farms you see the figures there. Mountain zebra from approximately 15 to 970. That's Peter Flack's figures of 2030. There'll be much more now. Waterbok up to 2,900. Black willow beast 29,000. Lesbok 59,000. And blue willow beast to 30,000. It is a massive effort of wildlife ranchers. And it should be acknowledged. We've earned the right to speak for rewilding more than 18 million hectares of agricultural marginal land, resulting in serious habitat rehabilitation. Because if you don't rehabilita re re rehabilitate your habitat, you cannot have wildlife. Nobody hunts on a feeding lot. We have earned the right to speak, and Gerard has shown these figures to you, 97 of, of, of RB, 87% of black willoughbees, 95% of Roe, 97 of Sable, 88 of Bontebok, and 90% of Blesbok in private ownership. And guys, what's the anomaly? EWT makes a count, a count of these animals in South Africa. And they count these animals in protected areas. And they say these animals are seriously threatened. They don't count, count one animal which is on a game round because it's not a protected area. How ridiculous can you be? I ask again, with what are we busy? If we can kill people for rhino and we can't count, and we want to have a management regime of wildlife on those principles, with what are we busy? 
we will lose them all. We have earned the right to speak with more than 65% of white rhino on, in private ownership. And after the after the slaughter of the past six years, it must be definitely must be higher than 65%. We've earned the right to speak for protection of our hunting heritage and traditionally and traditions by annually contributing more than 28 billion to the national economy. Stephen has given us a fantastic picture of where we come from and how important hunting is to us. Whether it's fur game or whether it's fed, feathered game, the contribution is massive. And because of that, there's wildlife. For respectfully commemorating the animals we harvest from the wild and through which we make an additional annual contribution of more than 500 million to the national economy. If you want to tell me that those animals and that is not respectful. You don't understand what you just said. We have earned the right to speak and to maintain and live our heritage and traditions. Our people have all earned the right to display and live their traditions and are entitled to wear the skins of game animals which portray their status and their cultural adherence. I challenge you to convince the Zulu royal family to start wearing printed cloth with leopard patterns on it instead of a real leopard skin. I challenge you. There's an old Dutch saying, when the wind really blows, some people build castles and others build windmills. As a collective, we have now through the Sustainable Use Coalition Southern Africa, or SUPO SA, reached the stage where we have to and can build windmills. The first windmill is initiating super. See that picture in For the first time in this country is history. Associations in wildlife and in hunting have come together with an agenda which suits them all and which they drive as a collective for the first time. This country is known for the division between its hunting associations and its wildlife associations. And unfortunately, that is so. It is still so today. But let us say that at least in this coalition, there's one vision, and we have a saying amongst ourselves, we take a bullet for each other. That's how strong this relationship between the founding associations of Super South Africa. Suko was founded in May 2021 and we represent roughly a little bit more than 74,000 people. It consists of the Confederation of Hunting Associations of South Africa, Java, the National Hunting and Shooting Association, also known as NATSHOOT or NHSA, the Professional Hunters Association of South Africa, known as FASA. I pronounce it FASA and then they become prostitutes. <laughs> Because I asked, are you professional hunters or professional hunters? Neither have we made. They are here. South African Falconer Association, Stephen told you about the importance of that association and what that brings into the feathered cap of South Africa. South African Predator Association, which we have to be very proud of, irrespective of what everybody says. These guys have done fantastic and sterling work, and they are continuously doing that. The South African Taxidermy and Tannery Associations, people tend to forget that. The work these people do is out of the box. And it's the only place that we as hunters can have our <coughs> memories portrayed respectfully. South African Wing Shooters Association, the guys who do bird hunting, they're not a very large association, but they're very strong. And they've got very powerful members and they do sterling work. Andre van der Beste is in, and these guys in the wing shooters do fantastic work. The True Green Alliance from Thompson and his fight against the, the anti-group and the animal rightists is well known for what he's written. And, and we're proud to have him in our midst, just as we're proud to have Wildlife Ranch in South Africa with us. So those are the founding members of SUPO. It's a powerful coalition. Got a lot of capacity, got a lot, a lot of decent people who all have a passion for wildlife and would like to see that the wildlife in this country survive and grow. 
And it can only do that if we have an economic sustainable model. Our logo is, it refers to the Fibonacci numbers, also known as pi or pi, and which you can then, if you graphically uh, uh, portray it, it becomes known as the golden circle of life. And also designates a geogrammet, geogram, geometrical, also designates a geometrical natural equilibrium of the whole, because we're looking at an equilibrium. We're looking at, you never have equilibrium and, and nature in a flat line. It never is a flat line. We have rain and we have drought. Van Warmelua, my doyen of anthropology, always said there's only one thing we know in Africa, and that is that we'll have drought, and that's true. But that designates where our logo, logo comes from, and we say, let them hear who want to hear. Sukar is a public NGO in application to become, we are applying to become an, an, a non-profit organization, and the most prominent of our job objectives is to stand in solid, unified protection of all forms of legal, sustainable use of renewable natural resources. Coal and gold and stuff like that is not renewable. To correlate, create, and become a repository for credible, scientific, and practical knowledge supporting the doctrine of sustainable use. To ensure strong strategic liaison between coalition members to maximize strengths, minimize weaknesses, and avoid duplication of efforts. We have capacity, we must use it. To share to the public useful and educational facts on the benefits of sustainable use, and the resultant importance of habitat conservation. If you don't farm with grass, you cannot farm with bontebok. You have to farm with grass. That's where it begins, and you have to farm with trees. To create capacity to ensure positive influence in every sphere of policy affecting all aspects related to sustainable use and habitat conservation. Guys, that's enough. Our website is up. We're working on it constantly. Thank you, Ani. Uh, thank you for the fantastic work you do for us. Uh, we can't say thank you enough. There's the address, suco-sa.org.za. And we've also got a Facebook page. Um, I'm an old man, so I don't know how it works. I just took the screen pic from, from, my, from my computer. And... and um, and you see it in Afrikaans, but it doesn't matter. You get the idea. And then we've got a short list of current tasks. To understand the impact of resolutions of the IUC UN World Congress, which ended on the 11th of September. Karat has alluded to it. One of the resolutions taken was this, what they call 30 by 30. Karat has hit the nail on the head. We have very much close to that in this country. We don't need extra protected areas. Government and the departments of nature conservation in the different provinces cannot maintain the current protected areas they are responsible for. I invite you just to drive around and see in what state conservation areas in the provinces are. So why would you want to even make larger land protected? Who are you going to remove? To where? Where are you going to get the money to run those protected areas decently? If you can't run the current conservation areas, you are responsible decently. I go so far as to say that conservation areas, protected areas in provinces, the only benefit they have are for the people who work there. They have no benefit for anybody else. I ask again, what are we busy with? To investigate legal opposition to the Department of Environmental Affairs proposed policy on sustainable use of the so-called iconic species if litigation becomes necessary. We're not in this for a fight. We don't want to fight, but we have. We will. If we have to go to litigation, we will because we have facts on our side. 
You investigate and act on non-release of the leopard hunting quota by the Minister of the Department of Environment, the President Sir Travis. Last year, they released the quota in October and they wanted us to hunt it in November. This year it's the same. What are you busy with? The latest of the Minister is, is that she's going to put this leopard quota out there for public comment. Whereas psyches have given her the permission to do this. Why doesn't she issue the permits? It, it becomes ridiculous. Open membership to Suto for interested and appropriate associations or individuals. And phrase and distribute short social media focused factual information briefs and infographics of economic worth of game ranching and hunting in sustaining rural economy. In this country, the term rural and rural communities has taken on the meaning that it is communal communities. Or it is the townships around towns. Those become rural communities. It's ridiculous. The people in Alma who have the farms and the people in Alma township self and the township of all the tin houses and the RDP houses, all of them in that valley, they constitute the rural community. And they are all dependent on one another. And the sooner we realize that those are our rural communities and that we have economic basis and an economic footprint in each of these rural communities and that we can build something around it if we work together, the quicker we'll get there. But in this country, the only form you have to fill in which asks your race is a government form. Come on, guys. Why? I'm South African. I've been in this country, my, my, my forebearers, for seven, seven generations. You think I associate with the Dutch where I come from? I don't. I go into this, the neat streets of Switzerland and I stand aghast at the cleanliness of it and at, at the punctuality and in the second day it kills me. Then I long for the hustle and bustle of the markets in Dar es Salaam or in, in, in Maravasta. Those are the things that I can compare myself with. I'm an African. And I can never become an Afro-American because I'm not black. But I'm an African. And as we sit here, we are all African. So wake up. We have to understand transformation. Transformation is one of the biggest lip service words in this country's history. The stuff which they write about transformation in rural communities, which I've explained to you how they understand it, are stuff that I've been reading in all of my studies since 1980. The words are the same. The narrative is the same. If you look at the results, none. Because they don't know how to manage it. And even if they know, the bureaucracy is so large that they always want to be in charge of stuff which they don't understand. Just go and speak to Mapua. That's no, Mapua. They're in the corner, yeah. up there, the, 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 the western corner of Kruger National Park in the Limpopo. They drop the fence. If they want to hunt there, they must first speak to Sand Parks, Kruger National Park, because the, the animals there, says that Kruger National Park, are theirs. And if they want to manage this thing further, they must speak to Ledet first, because Ledet are are the people that give the permits and say what happens there, but the land belongs to the people of Mapua. I ask you, okay, what are we busy with? We have to understand transformation and we have to make it work, guys. It's a massive challenge and we have to do it quickly. The super task seems daunting, but we take heart from the wisdom of the Dalai Lama when he says, if you think too, you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping with the whiskey. Thank you for your valuable time. Thank you. Um, guys, um, have, you, have you got questions or stuff which we can have a look at? Uh, will you give us two or three minutes, please, just, just to get this, this stuff down? And get, get all of the guys with the answers. Let them sit here, and then you can ask them.
good. Guys, give us give us two or three minutes, please. Let us just organize ourselves here, and then we'll go to the questions. I just need to understand how we got questions and how many questions we have. Please just give us a few moments. Jullie is nou een rechte boerenpersdag. Jy nie te vrede is met die goed dafte en die tafel. Oké, nee goed. Dan laten we ze bij die tijd om te praten. Dan hier is de beslissvraag om daarover te praten.